a young man is down on his luck and decides to take a job in an out-of-the-way prison for the mentally unstable. What will ensue? Well, my dear friends, we're about to find out in tonight's video, a five-part story of which I'm doing the first two parts this evening, and I will continue with parts three, four, and five on Wednesday, because I know you like having the longer ones, and you don't like having to wait around. So I'm doing the whole series across the next two videos. And it's a real cracker, I can tell you. I know you're going to enjoy this one. If you're fans of the abandoned prison stories or asylums and psychiatric wars and things like that. So my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Okay, I'll be blunt. I might have been a screw up for most of my life. So... Job opportunities weren't exactly lining up in front of me. And after a couple of hundred resumes sent out, only one job came through. Silver Woods Prison. Located in a tiny-ass town no one's ever heard of. In the most desolate area of my country. And as if that wasn't sketchy enough to immediately decline the offer, they'd pay me almost three times my previous salary. Do I even have to mention how desperate I've been for money? Just in the past year, I lost my previous job, my girlfriend, and my mother passed away from a horrible disease, diagnosed far too late to even begin to treat. Not to talk about how I took up a stupid student loan to pay for an education I never got to use. Maybe this is enough to understand why I happily agreed to move away from everyone and everything I'd ever known desperate attempt at starting over. In all honesty, I don't even remember applying for that job, but having sent out hundreds of applications for various jobs and falling into a deep pit of depression, I didn't have the luxury of declining. Oh, I wouldn't call myself suicidal. Being risky enough to somehow end up on the wrong side of life didn't seem like such a bad deal. I started on a Monday. And though I might not possess many valuable life skills, I sure as hell am a punctual person. The drive wouldn't be more than ten minutes, according to the GPS. Yet I must have gotten lost somewhere. After five minutes, I entered a forest. With roads so run down and ridiculous turns that shouldn't even exist, as the road to work was mostly a straight drive. Despite having left my new home in the twilight hours... It had darkened during my short drive, as time itself had reverted back on me. I arrived a little past seven, just a few minutes late despite having left with an ample amount of time. Not the best first impression, so I hurried myself towards the main gate. The yard was clearly in view from the parking lots, empty at that time of day. It awoke an eerie feeling of desolation. But I shook it off as first day jitters. Just inside the main entrance, a guard greeted me from the reception. A mountain of a person, sitting in a chair about to give up on the massive creature sitting in it. He was reading a heavily torn book, holding it upside down while doing so. His name tag read, Herbert Johnson. Seeing me completely out of place awoke him from whatever story he'd been reading. Ah, you must be the rookie. Howard over there will give you the tour. A tall but quite skinny man walked over and shook my hand. Howard Banks. So, you're the new guy, huh? Yeah, that'd be me, I responded. My tardiness didn't even faze them, so I glanced down at my wristwatch, only to see I'd arrived somehow ten minutes early. Howard took note of my confusion and smiled. Yeah, happens to us all. Don't worry about it. You looked over the notes we sent you. What notes? The Zelensky Protocol. Howard shot back. What? Uh, never mind. It's not important. Howard took me through the endless, empty hallways. No staff or inmates to be seen anywhere. Man, I do not envy you. You're about the fourth one to take the job this quarter, he said. Excuse me, the fourth? Oh, 
shit. They didn't tell you? He said, genuinely surprised. Hey, everyone that works under Dr. Zelensky eventually quits. No freaking clue why, but so far they all have. I wasn't quite sure what to make of that statement. He said it with such glee and humor, I thought he might not be serious. Or maybe that fact brought some entertainment to his otherwise boring job. Whatever the reason, he didn't make me feel too comfortable. That's the doctor over there. So, your job will pretty much be to follow him around while he checks on the sick inmates. The doctor was walking around the block with his head down in a shout. Hey, Doc, Howard called out. Zelensky briefly lifted his head to glance in our general direction. Who's the new kid? he asked. <laughs> your own personal guard. You can't just roam around here on your own anymore. Not after the, um, last incident, Howard said. Another ominous statement said facetiously. All right, whatever you say. Hey, walk with me. The doctor nodded his head at me. We started walking down cell block D which, on its own, could house around 40 inmates. While all the cells were empty, they were clearly inhabited, based on personal effects and messy beds. Where is everyone? I asked. Out in the yard. I like to do my rounds in peace. Only my patients remain inside. But I just walked by the yard. <laughs> yeah, well... That's something you'll just have to get used to. Zelensky led me to the infirmary. A surprisingly modern clinic, with enough room for eight patients who required more intense care, and a separate room for more ambulatory inmates. All right. You stay outside while I see a couple of patients and finish my paperwork. Keep yourself occupied however you see fit. He pointed to an old wooden chair with a broken leg. The two nurses working in the infirmary alongside Zelensky looked exceptionally burnt out. They were tending to the clinic's only two patients, both old and holding onto life by a thin thread. I sat on the chair, ready to kill some time by browsing the internet. Zelensky himself clearly didn't care, and there were no threats around. Of course, as I opened the browser, I realized there weren't any bars. No connection to the internet at all. Oh, great, I sighed to myself, as Zelensky interrupted. All right, kid, let's move on. I snapped back to attention, Zelensky gesturing me to follow him back into the cell block. That was quick, I said. Quick? That was three hours. I quickly glanced down at my phone to check. And sure enough, three hours had passed. I looked back at Zelensky. He noticed my confusion and chuckled. <laughs> Don't worry. That happens around here sometimes. Time is not always what it seems. He waved his hand again and got me to follow. I was dumbstruck. But I did as I was told. We walked down the cell blocks to a room just around the corner, separated from the rest, and covered by solid walls as opposed to the usual bars. Cell 144. This patient is not going to hurt me, so stay out here unless I call for you, he demanded. I did as commanded, and he went inside. Despite the walls, it was easy to overhear the conversation going on. Good morning, Harold. Zelensky said, casually. How are you feeling today? Who the hell are you? Where's my doctor? Harold snarked back. I am your doctor, he said, completely unfazed by the rudeness. In fact, I'm the only one who has been doing these rounds for the past ten years. There was a moment of silence, while I heard someone writing on paper. I'm not even supposed to be in here. I didn't do anything wrong. You killed someone, Harold. I keep telling you, but you never listen. I know, but, but it, it was well within my rights. 
She broke into my house in the middle of the freaking night. She was your wife. Yeah, that's what she said too. And maybe she even had the same voice, but it wasn't her. Zelensky sighed. Until you can come to terms with what you did, there's nothing more I can do for you. There was a small window on the door for me to see through. But Dr. Zelensky was standing in front of the patient, so there wasn't much to see. As far as I could tell, he was changing some bandage covering the patient's head. Within a couple of minutes, he finished with the patient, leaving him to continue his day in the tiny cell that had become his home. All right, kid. Back to the clinic. More paperwork awaits. How come that guy didn't come to the clinic like the others? What's his deal? I asked. Ah, oh, poor sap. He suffers from prosopagnosia, facial blindness. He couldn't even recognize his own wife, and so he killed her. I felt a mixture between sadness and anger. Conflicting emotions leaving me unable to decide if I should judge or pity the man. He got a feel for the guy, though. He didn't realize what he was doing. Just thought some stranger had broken in. I take it the insanity plea didn't work. Well, it worked, Zelensky said. That's why he's locked in that room. But not for killing his wife, no. Here we have murderers, rapists, and violent criminals all over. It's what happened next that sent him in there. Next? Yes, as he went into the bathroom to clean himself up. He realized a stranger was looking back from the mirror. So he decided he would remove his own face with a kitchen knife. Zelensky paused, checking over to see if I was too disgusted for him to continue. Truth be told, I was. But he went on anyway. After that, he decided it wasn't enough. So he cut at his scalp and tried to remove his eyes. Luckily, the screaming that ensued was enough to wake the neighbors, who promptly called the police. He passed out before he could finish, which is why he still has one functioning eye. I shook my head and mumbled under my breath. Jeez, what the f... This is the mildest form of horror you'll see here. So are you really sure you want to work here, kid? It's not like I have a choice. Oh, I have a name, I firmly responded, trying to sound more confident than I actually was. Zelensky scoffed. You'll have a name if you can take working here for more than one week. We started heading back to the clinic. One of the cells was now quarantined, plastic drapes sealing off the entire thing. Hey, I wasn't sealed off like that when we got here, I told Zelensky. Yes, that's cell 89. It does that sometimes. Just don't ever go inside. What do you mean it just does that? Some days it's quarantined, so other times it isn't. I can't explain it, and quite frankly, I don't want to. People who get curious tend to vanish. How else do you think you got this job? He said it so matter-of-factly, it was clear he'd been dealing with this for years. Much like the time-lapse earlier, he simply brushed it off like it wasn't a big deal. I spent the rest of the day hanging around the clinic, waiting for Zelensky to finish his paperwork. All right, time to head home. Make sure you're out of here before ten past six. Otherwise, you're going to have to spend the night. Why? Do they lock the prison? No, I mean you physically won't be able to leave. Happened to me a couple of times. Weird feeling, to say the least. Then he shrugged and packed his briefcase. Be ready for tomorrow, kid. It's going to get a lot weirder. Needless to say, I've sent out a few extra resumes. But, for the time being, I'm stuck working at Silverwood's prison. I'll keep you updated. Once again, I headed back to the prison. 
and once more I was taken aback by the immense darkness surrounding me. Time simply didn't move in a straight line on that road. I arrived just a few minutes before my shift started and headed inside. Again, the yard was empty as I entered the building. Hey, you're late, rookie, Herbert said without looking up from his book. What are you talking about? I'm five min- I glanced at my phone to check the time. I was suddenly an hour late. Once again, time had elapsed without my knowledge. Oh, f I am late. That's what I said, rookie. A lot of crazy ass shit goes down in this prison. That's why I'm staying here, close by the door. I jogged the rest of the way to the clinic. Luckily, Zelensky was still there doing paperwork. Doctor, I'm sorry, time just got... <laughs> I said before he interrupted. I know, it happens sometimes. There isn't anything to do about it. Don't worry. He looked up from his papers. In fact, you're right on time. I do need your help for the patients in the basement. You keep patients in the basement, I said, sounding more shocked than intended. Well, yes, they aren't exactly what you would call sentient. Right, are you going to explain what that means? Even if I did, you would not understand it, he said. We started walking through the same cell block as last time, cell block D and it was completely empty again. Dr. Zelensky, where are the inmates? I asked. Out in the yard. Pretty much where they spend all their free time. Not that many are kept in Block D anyway. Yeah, but I just arrived and I didn't see anyone in the yard. Oh, yes, as I mentioned yesterday, it doesn't exactly work how you'd expect. Basically, you can't really see the yard from outside. What do you mean? Well, there's some weird filter out there. You can only see the people in the yard from the inside. That makes absolutely no sense. Maybe not. But clearly reality doesn't care if it makes sense to you now, does it? I didn't ask any further questions. Clearly no one knew, and it wasn't worth the risk to explore it. He led me towards the basement, which was through Block D. There were three doors leaning to different parts of the building, such as the generator room, storage facility, and finally, the basement. To get down, we had to push ourselves through a narrow staircase, crudely built into a narrow tunnel. All walls were made out of mountainous terrain the passage had been dug into, which were all dimly lit up by bulbs hanging from the ceiling. The basement was large, with multiple rows of beds covering the entire room. Next to each bed stood frail patients with intravenous lines hanging down from empty medicine bags. None of the people moved. They simply stood idly next to their beds, all facing the same direction. What the hell? I said far too loudly. Yes, we've got to change their banana bags and then put them back to bed. They always stand like this? Yes, and usually get up a few times a week. Zelensky headed for a line of fridges, each filled to the brim with medical bags, or banana bags as he called them. The patients had swollen, edematous feet from standing still so long, with visible varicose veins running up and down each leg. I walked carefully up to one, and waved my hand in front of his eyes. He didn't react at all. So, what happened to them? I asked. Beats me. They've been here since I started. Sometimes one of them will simply disappear, and a new one might just walk himself into the prison. We usually find the new ones wandering aimlessly around the halls. He looked over at my terrified face. <laughs> Don't worry, kid. They're completely harmless. Upon inspection, they were obviously alive, though saying that they were actually living might be an overstatement. I could see their chests move, and visible breath came out of them, as if they were in the cold. Would you kindly help me? Zelensky interrupted. Together we changed each bag, 
34 patients occupied the basement. Afterwards, we put them to bed. How can we just don't tie them down? Ah, oh, they don't seem to like it. Keep wriggling and the ropes dig into their skin. Awful sight. I only tried it once and let me tell you, I won't be the one cleaning up the blood this time. After putting them back to bed, Zelensky put bandages on their legs for compression against the blood pooling in the legs, he said. He then walked around and counted them. Nine, thirty, thirty-one. Oh, shit. What? I asked. Three of them are missing. Well, didn't you say they randomly disappear? Yes, I did, but never more than one at a time. We've got to search the prison. But prepare yourself. This might be an ugly sight. We ran upstairs back to Block D. We found the first patient fairly quickly. A lady who looked to be about 300 years too old for life. Somehow, her arm was stuck inside the wall. Not by breaking it, but to the best of my explanation, she appeared to be morphed inside. Oh, God's sake, not again, Zelensky said. All right, look, stay here and keep an eye on her. I'll be back with some tools in about five minutes. Whatever you do, do not stop looking at her. If you do, she'll move further inside the wall. And with that, he ran off. I simply stood speechless, looking at a woman who didn't seem to care that her arm had become one with a concrete wall. She was as catatonic as every other patient from the basement. I did my best to follow orders and not let her out of my sight. But my concentration was broken by the sounds of footsteps behind me, slowly walking in my direction. It sounded like someone was wearing wet shoes, dripping all over the floor. The sound echoed through the halls, getting louder with each step. Dr. Zelensky, is that you? I asked. There was no response. The sound got louder, mixed with strange guttural breathing. I couldn't resist. I turned around to see what horrors had been making that sound, but of course, nothing was there. I stared into the empty halls, looking for whatever had made those disgusting noises. The shock had almost made me forget the woman who was stuck in the wall. When I checked on her again, her head had morphed inside the wall alongside her arm. The part of her still outside was convulsing. Not knowing what else to do, I ran over and attempted to pull her out. It was futile. Before I knew it, Zelensky had come running back with a sledgehammer and an electric drill. What happened? he asked. I, I couldn't... <laughs> Out of the way, he yelled as he smashed the wall with a hammer. It took over a full minute to destroy the wall, and by the time Zelensky had finally broken through, the woman was long gone. I flopped to the floor with my back against the wall in despair. It was my fault she'd died. All right, so what happened? He asked calmly. I tried as best as I could to explain what I'd heard, but my words were jumbled and nothing seemed to make sense, not even to myself. But Zelensky seemed genuinely understanding. It wasn't your fault, kid. I was surprised at the statement, to say the least. Sometimes you hear strange sounds, and most of the time, it isn't anything good. Your own safety comes before anything else. That's the first rule of surviving here. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now, was all I could respond. He thought for a bit. You go home. Have a few beers, then we'll do it all over again tomorrow. This place is horrifying. But as long as you do as I say, we're safe. I promise you that much. I nodded, packed my things, and got out of there. For the time, I wasn't even sure I'd return. But the thought of letting someone else suffer that job, of facing yet another failure in my life, was unbearable. On my way out, I saw Herbert still sitting in his booth, 
now doing a Sudoku puzzle. Will you be back again tomorrow? He asked. Yep, I responded, without looking at him. So I think that sets up the weirdness just enough to tempt you back on Wednesday. It does, doesn't it? Say it will, yes, yes. <laughs> Come on. All right, so I promise um, I will be concluding that story with the final three parts all in one video on Wednesday evening so you don't have to wait around too long for the conclusion. So, enough for one evening. To be honest, I wanted to do all of it in one video, but I simply haven't had time to record everything in one go. But I will be back, and I know you're going to join me. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?